pregnancy plays an important role in the onset and development of chronic venous disease. Um, sorry, I'm going to flip back to there. Um, changes in the venous system actually during pregnancy are linked to hormonal changes as well as compression um, from the growing uterus on the pelvic vessels. And as venous disease specialists, the correlation between multiple pregnancies and progressive venous disease is something obvious. We've all seen it. Um, both hormonal changes, mechanical anatomical changes of pregnancy will affect the venous system, causing all of those familiar symptoms that we see. And unfortunately, a lot of women may suffer from heavy, painful edematous legs during pregnancy, and not much is offered in the way of uh, symptom relief or follow-up. So it's a good idea to know a little bit about what goes on in there. Uh, the hemodynamics in pregnancy actually start uh, very early in pregnancy. Peak changes occur about mid-late second trimester. Cardiac output begins to increase by five weeks gestation and is 35 to 40% above baseline uh, by the end of the first trimester. It continues to uh, increase throughout the second trimester until it's approximately 50% greater than non-pregnant. So hearts are working pretty hard to sustain the system. Um, everything returns to pre-pregnancy levels by about 12 weeks postpartum. You've got uh, the kidneys working harder. You've got an increased plasma volume. Uh, the red cell volume doesn't increase uh, the same degree. So we see dilutional anemias. Peripheral venous resistance uh, decreases. So you've got a very dilated system with more uh, volume in it and a heart that's working harder to keep up. The changes that are seen in early pregnancy, this is often a test question as well, is you know what hormones affect uh, these um, changes. Estrogen, progesterone, progesterone uh, relaxin, prostacycline are the big ones. Your kidneys uh, have a big impact as well with the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone uh, system. And what you find is just a dilutional anemia, an increased cardiac output, increased heart rate, increased stroke volume, slight decrease in blood pressure and everything does pretty much uh, hit steady state uh, at, at an increased level. Third trimester works much harder during labor and then pretty much returns to a baseline uh, pre-pregnancy level by 10 to 12 weeks after delivery. Knowing that uh, pregnant women do have uh, risk for venous disease, it's compounded with increasing numbers of pregnancy. So for most women, the third pregnancy seems to be the tip over point where their legs just really become symptomatic. There are age related risks like with non-pregnant folks, three or more pregnancies, and then your family history of cardiovascular, I'm sorry, uh, chronic venous disease is um, a big player in there like for anyone else who's not pregnant. Older gravitas have more venous disease than younger women, and it's uh, it's the age-related risk. But if you look at um, women who are 40 years of age, if you look at them as first-time pregnant versus their fifth pregnancy, you see a marked increase in women with symptomatic venous disease based on those increasing numbers of pregnancies. There's a, a little study from Brazil that looked at 352 women, just all comers to their uh, prenatal assistance program. And they did clinical SEEP scoring. They scored everybody who has spider veins on up. And what they found is actually 73% of women in their population presented with um, some manifestation of venous disease. So it really is as common as we think it is. When you look at the pathophysiology um, there are mechanical and hormonal theories for the cause or mechanism of venous disease in pregnancy. Two theories that try to explain uh, worsening of varicose veins um, really combine both of these mechanisms. Hormonal um, changes cause that increase in volume, uh, venous distensibility, and those veins that distend don't necessarily come back to normal uh, completely. But what does change is that. Uh, compression that we have um, in the pelvis once the baby is delivered. When you look at um, the increase in venous pressure, especially femoral venous pressures in supine position, they increase remarkably during pregnancy. And if you think about the, that passenger sitting in there compressing the um, great 
vessels in the pelvis. It's really, it, the, it makes sense, right? The anatomy makes sense. You put a very weighty structure on top of these deep vessels. And in a supine position, this little MRI over here shows that the vena cava can actually be compressed almost completely, you know, almost complete occlusion by um, third trimester. And simply turning uh, a pregnant woman off onto her side a little bit, left lateral or right lateral, uh, you can in increase blood flow um, through those great vessels. A really interesting little study that came out um, is in the uh, Journal of Maternal Fetal Medicine, Neonatal Medicine. The perinatologists were wondering if they could somehow explain late third trimester uh, demises, fetal deaths, based on sleeping positions. So they took 12 pregnant women, 35 to 38 weeks of pregnancy, and they did MRIs laying on their back and then turned off left lateral. And what they found is that the blood flow through the IVC decreased at its origin by 85%. And the azagous vein, um, granted it was good and healthy, took over you know, as a collateral 220% um, increased flow through the azagous system because of the compression in the, the IVC. So they felt that was pretty significant. But the interesting thing was that blood flow through the aorta down at the level of the bifurcation actually decreased by 32%. So there may be real sludging through the placenta and significant decreased oxygen uh, supply for women who are sleeping on their back. So a little bit more um, pressure to get women to sleep over left lateral when they are in, in their later stages of pregnancy. That's also a reason why you can see supine hypotension so that if you're scanning any of these women in clinic, um, keeping them off on their side is a good idea. I like this little graph. This is from 1943. Um, the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology is referenced regularly uh, just looking at venous pressures in the um, dorsal decubitus or supine position at the femoral vein and at the antecubital vein, thinking that pressure shouldn't change in the antecubital, antecubital vein because it's, um, it doesn't have the compression effect uh, from the pregnancy. And what they found, because they're, they were looking at, is it more the compression effect of the pregnancy that's altering these pressures, or is it the hormones? And they found that in the very beginning of pregnancy, before the uterus gets to be that weighty, you actually have a marked increase in venous pressure in the femoral vein, so that it has to be hormones that are working this early versus the size of the pregnancy. By the end, obviously, femoral, or femoral venous pressures increase as you would expect, and they return to normal postpartum. So there's pretty good evidence for both that it's probably the hormones that start kicking things off. And then as the pregnancy progresses, it's more of the compressive effect. This study out of Brazil, very small, um, was looking at whether or not venous diameters measured during pregnancy could tell you much about uh, studying women during pregnancy for venous disease, like was it worthwhile or, or do all the changes kind of go back to normal afterward? So it was in Brazil. It's with very thin pregnant women, which is um, a hard thing to find. The BMIs had to be less than 25. They had to have an absence of any type of precursor or comorbidity that increased their risk for venous disease. And they got uh, 26 women and then three women were booted out because they gained weight. Um, you know, they got all of these women, they scanned them between um, first trimester and postpartum. And they looked at things like the um, diameters of the common femoral, the great saphenous vein. They looked at some filling indices, the ejection fraction, and it's a very small number. And so they said, wow, in second trimester, they had 5% of women uh, who had venous reflux, which is one woman. And in the third trimester, they had uh, a couple more. So there wasn't a, a big population. And really the take home message from this was that the veins that they looked at pretty much returned to normal diameters uh, after delivery. The venous filling index changed a little bit. The ejection fraction, um, mom's calf pump, didn't change much during pregnancy. There are some other studies, however. Um, 
Boyvin looked at 66 pregnant women with at least one varicose vein. So they had some venous disease coming into pregnancy and they found that um, superficial vein diameters, although they changed a bit during pregnancy, went back to the early pregnancy levels um, at um, postpartum. Um, Asputa pretty much got the same results when they looked at venous diameters and valve function. And they found that it returned to baseline in most cases, but an interesting one, Pemble right in the middle, they used 69 nullogravita women and they took 41 primogravitas and they measured vein diameters during pregnancy. And they found that with the pregnant women, their vein diameter went back to their early pregnancy size. But if they use the nullogravitas as a control, their, their venous diameters were still bigger than um, those who had never been pregnant. So we probably go back to our own baseline that we develop in the um, early stages of pregnancy due to those hormone changes. So there's a little bit of difference with the pregnancy. And then as you add several pregnancies, those differences become more marked and more symptomatic. And so overall, what most people conclude is that it's really not uh, necessary to check people during pregnancy to see if they have insufficiency because their veins do change and they do regress in the postpartum period. When you look at treating venous disease during pregnancy, reassuring patients, explaining to them what's going on, the course of venous disease, what they can do to help relieve symptoms, what they can do lifestyle, like modification wise, to rest, to elevate, to wear compression, to try to manage their weight gain, um, and then looking out for family history and knowing whether or not uh, you have to counsel them for uh, thrombosis risk. Every patient um, should know if they have varicose veins to watch out for uh, a growing warm red you know, varicosity, uh, warning them what phlebitis is and letting them know to come back to you so that you can evaluate and treat that for them. But on the whole, it's really not a great idea to do a full insufficiency scan for diagnosis and planning of treatment during pregnancy. It's really not indicated. If you ever see somebody second trimester forward and they get um, supine hypotension, hot and sweaty, and um, their heart is racing and they feel faint, it's just an ugly place to be in the um, scan room with somebody who feels like they're going to faint. Um, God forbid a, a pregnant woman fall down in clinic then you're now are tied uh, ever onward to any kind of complication they could have with that pregnancy. But scanning them a little tilted left lateral looking for DVT is something that we're gonna be called on to do. So during pregnancy, talking to them about resting, uh, more left lateral, uh, elevating you know, the foot of the bed or elevating their legs as they sit, and then physical exercise, keeping the legs going. So as they are able to, if they have any other pregnancy-related complications, certainly you defer to their obstetrician. But walking, swimming, yoga, stretching, making sure that their calf muscle pump stays in good shape um, lifelong is a good idea. Watching weight and then using compression. Compression recommendations are the same as they are uh, for non-pregnant folks. Uh, anybody who is just getting started in pregnancy, no real symptoms, a 15 to 20 is a good place to start. And then anyone who actually has venous disease symptomatic uh, follows the same recommendation as uh, non-pregnant uh, patients. The thing with pregnancy, um, something that you can consider uh, discussing, especially as the weather is getting warmer, is that if you layer compression, if you layer 10 to 20s, or you put a 10 to 20 over a 15 to 20 or 20 to 30, you can actually add compression and get better compression. And then as things get warmer, or if they have difficulty maintaining, um, you know, a, a posture where they're bent over to get these compression on with that growing belly, getting two lighter compression socks on is easier than getting one 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 on at, you know, for certain folks. So considering that um, our pregnant women should be a little bit more flexible than our 80 year olds, that's not always the case. So suggesting to them that they work with layering compression may actually get more folks to be compliant with compression. Overall, for vulvar varicosities, there's not a lot of help during pregnancy. The V supporter really only works to keep um, like an ice pack or something in there. That's really not a really solid form of compression. Um, 
elevating and, and keeping the pressure off the pelvic floor. The prenatal cradle does a little bit better uh, with that, just kind of lifting up and in to pull the, the pregnant belly and the baby a little bit closer so that some of the drag or some of the pressure on those pelvic veins can be helped a little bit. But overall, it's more just a, a waiting and watching and giving them hope for evaluation and treatment afterward. So when we talk about thromboembolic disease in pregnancy, pregnant women have an increased risk for VTE. So the likelihood of seeing a woman in our practice with a DVT during pregnancy does exist. Um, we're quite likely to see a pregnant woman with SVT. Um, a lot of us have seen those, understand how to treat it. And you can make uh, a relationship there where you can explain to them what's going on and why they need to come back and see you after they are pregnant. With um, all causes of venous thromboembolic disease, it's about 50-50 whether you're going to see these events during pregnancy or postpartum. Uh, the risk per day is greatest in the weeks immediately postpartum. Most VTE events are DVTs, um, 20 to 25% are PEs, but PEs are responsible for about 20% of maternal deaths in the United States. So it's a significant uh, medical emergency and something to keep in mind when you're asked to see these folks. The physiologic and anatomic changes, uh, verkose triad is at work. You know, you've got venous stasis, you've got that big dilated system, you've got compression of the vessels, especially as this person gets bigger, you get more compression there, you get outflow obstruction. Um, endothelial injury happens uh, anytime there is trauma to the mom, including labor delivery. Um, there's more risk uh, with C-section because there is more trauma and more um, stasis induced, and then the recovery is a little bit slower. There's more stasis with mom not getting up and moving. Uh, so mobility factors as well. When you look at the clotting um, factors, uh, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. The changes that occur with your increased fibrinogen factor seven, eight, 10, these are a good idea as well. So it's not all against mom to make her clot and, and die from a thromboembolic event, but you have to consider that the placenta has to grow into the endometrium and myometrium endometrium, very vascular. It's a big muscle with um, a lot of uh, supply. The chorionic villi have to grow into the spiral arteries and set up um, this circulation for the baby. So you want this to happen, minimizing the risk of blood loss to mom. So there actually really is reason that um, mom shouldn't bleed as easily during pregnancy. Also think about the fact that when this placenta is 300% bigger at the time of delivery, all of those uh, vascular connections are wide open as that placenta has to now break away and separate. And there is an incredible system of um, I want to say uh, constriction, constriction of all those vessels as that placenta starts to break away, but also having a bit more working for you in the clotting cascade keeps mom from hemorrhaging at delivery. When you look at all causes for uh, venous thromboembolic disease in pregnancy, you go with your general risk factors. So, you know, somebody's age, their weight, their immobility, any uh, concomitant illnesses that can increase their risk uh, for uh, thromboembolism, venous thromboembolism, including smoking. There are still some pregnant moms who smoke. Uh, family history, actually, we have to think about uh, old ways. But complications of pregnancy, so anybody who comes in who's got multifetal pregnancy, who's had infections, bleeding, transfusion, um, hyperemesis actually is a risk from the dehydration standpoint, and possibly some of the other metabolic stuff that goes on that increases those women's uh, experience of uh, hyperemesis. When you look at pregnant women and the clotting uh, factors that are the most uh, common or concerning, like factor five and prothrombin, with women who have an unremarkable family history, their risk is still high. But when you weigh in positive family history, you can actually see that their risk for clotting, even with heterozygous uh, factor fives or heterozygous prothrombin, actually increases pretty significantly. So when you're evaluating these folks or if uh, somebody asks your opinion, always make sure that you know family history as well as uh, this person's individual history. 
So DVTs and pregnancies are pretty much uh, equal across all trimesters. The left lower extremity seems to be affected a little bit more often, and that's uh, more consistent with that Maytherner anatomy and where that compression is happening directly up there on the left side. The DVTs in pregnancy more commonly involve the iliac iliofemoral veins, and they're more likely to embolize. So when patients present with a significant uh, DVT in pregnancy, they are iliofemoral, they're less likely to be just isolated uh, in the calf, but their presenting symptoms are often uh, different than the standard DVT that walks in for us as well. They have more thigh and buttock pain. So something to keep in mind also is that when you're looking at a pregnant woman and you do a DVT rule out, if their leg is really asymmetrically swollen and you really give a good story, you have to look up higher. You can't just leave it um, from the common femoral down. And just a note, um, D-dimers are really not something that we look at as a, an independent risk factor or diagnostic uh, approach to uh, these women and looking for DVT. Every trimester, D-dimer increases during pregnancy. So by itself, it is not a reliable test. So a simple workup for DVT starts with suspicion and your ultrasound. You do your compression ultrasound. If it's positive, you get a DVT and you they need to be treated. Again, D-dimer is not part of this. If you do a compression ultrasound and you really don't suspect iliac vessel uh, DVT, you know, the legs are not that asymmetrical. She's got that little ache or pain or twinge. Uh, she doesn't really have a lot of risk factors. She doesn't have a family risk. Could you follow these folks with just routine surveillance? Granted, you can assess those iliac veins at least by ultrasound. There actually has been a couple of studies that have shown that that strategy can be used during pregnancy and it can be used safely. So these folks um, looked at 221 pregnant women who presented with suspected DVT and they did an ultrasound. If their duplex was positive, they treated them and they went into the treatment arm. For those who were negative, and they could also assess up into the iliac, so they could get an ultrasound of the um, iliac vein. If they were negative, they followed them every two to three days over the course of a week. And if they never found uh, DVT, they continued to watch them over three months to see if anybody else had any other symptoms presented um, you know, with a missed DVT or a missed PE. And they actually found that serial duplex scans were 94% sensitive in pregnancy. So granted, you can get a good scan of the leg and you can assess that iliac vein. You don't have to go up any, any higher with um, any kind of venograms looking for a, a higher clot. When you consider pulmonary embolism, there are no specific clinical signs or symptoms that are really common um, or specific for pregnant women. Dyspnea is, is common in, in pregnant women and trying to discern whether their, their breathlessness has changed um, can just be anxiety with the concern that they could have a pulmonary embolism. PE accounts for 20% of maternal deaths in the United States. So you really have to have a high index of suspicion. So when you're looking at working somebody up and considering whether or not they could have a PE, know that your well score and your PERC criteria cannot be used. They haven't been validated in pregnancy. So you have to decide if you've done your duplex scan and they don't have a DVT, at least on your scan, but they are concerning for a pulmonary embolism, are you gonna go with a VQ or are you gonna go with a spiral CT? They are both relatively low in radiation exposure to mom and baby. Mom gets a little bit more exposure with the, the CT, actually is significantly higher, I guess, than the VQ. And the International Commission of Radiologic Protection has put out the statement that done properly, a spiral CT or helical CT versus a VQ scan, really neither one is more uh, detrimental to the fetus or to the pregnancy. That as long as the radiation is uh, 50 milligrays or less, which most of these studies are, if they're done in a good facility, the risk to the fetus is negligible. So there really is not going to be a marked increased risk of prenatal death, malformation, impairment, mental disability, um, 
And this is always the conversation that you have with the mom when she's gasping for air because nobody wants to hurt anybody's baby. But we have to also help mom understand that if she doesn't make it through the pregnancy, neither is you know, her baby. Or if she's like third trimester, it's nice to go home with your baby. Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, the American Thoracic Society um, actually puts chest x-ray in here. So suspect a PE in pregnancy, do you have leg symptoms or not? If you do, scan. If you find a clot, treat it and call it a presumptive PE if they're a bit more symptomatic. Doing a chest x-ray and then deciding what type of tests you're going to do to look for pulmonary embolism has led some people to question if you do a chest x-ray during the workup of a pulmonary embolism and more than 50% of patients with proven PE actually have a normal chest x-ray, why bother? It's extra radiation. But there's actually been uh, some work that's shown if you do a normal chest x-ray, if you do get a normal chest x-ray and you're going to decide which test to do, you actually get uh, a diagnosis when studied by VQ scan more often than you do with CAT scan. And then the opposite is true if you have an abnormal chest x-ray. So with an abnormal chest x-ray, um, a VQ scan is not going to be as good as a CT scan. So if you're looking at radiating people in general, but pregnancy um, in specific, it's nice to think that you can actually triage patients in a very logical way and decide which test is going to be more likely to give you a diagnosis so that you can be more confident when you're exposing these patients to radiation. Another nice uh, thing that has popped up here is that the YEARS algorithm has been uh, validated for use in evaluating for risk of PE. The YEARS criteria um, was validated in uh, folks who are 18 or older, and it's outpatient and inpatient uh, patients suspected of pulmonary embolism. It uses the top three um, criteria from the, the well score, the most predictive um, criteria from the well score, whether somebody looks like they have clinical signs of a DVT, hemoptysis, or if PE is your most likely diagnosis. And then they also threw a D-dimer in here. So if D-dimer levels are pretty low or are very low, depending on how many years criteria you have, you can actually make an educated uh, decision on whether or not to expose them. And in this case, they use CTPA. The nice thing about uh, the years uh, study when they first uh, got this going was they included pregnant women. They didn't have enough pregnant women to actually validate it in pregnancy, but pregnancy um, was actually a question on their survey. So what the Artemis study is, is a, an extension of the years study and 510 uh, pregnant women started out, it, it ended up with 498 pregnant women who were evaluated uh, for potential pulmonary embolism. And they took all of these women and evaluated them with uh, compression ultrasound if they, they kind of sort of had even little bits of symptoms for a potential DVT. So they threw compression ultrasound in here along with this algorithm. And actually got this to be validated in pregnancy. So this is very cool, I think. Um, so if you suspect somebody of a pulmonary embolism and you go through the year's criteria, do an ultrasound if they are kind of sort of symptomatic in their legs. If they are symptomatic in their legs and you find a DVT, they called it uh, a clinical PE and they stopped there. Whoops. Sorry about that. What... Um, what you follow down in this algorithm is if they had no years criteria and they had um, a D-dimer that was greater or equal to a thousand, that's when they put these folks through CTPA. If they had no years criteria and their D-dimer was less than a thousand, they did not um, they did not do a CTPA. They considered these folks negative for pulmonary embolism. And they followed everybody all the way through pregnancy, at least three months after this point. And they found that four patients had DVT and they considered that a clinical PE. There was one PE in the no years criteria with a D-dimer of greater or equal to a thousand. 
And then if patients met one to three years criteria, they used a D-dimer level of less than 500 as negative and didn't do a follow-up. But in those patients who had one to three years criteria and a D-dimer greater or equal to 500, they had uh, 15 PEs. So in total, they found 20 PEs. On follow-up, they didn't have any PEs um, show up in that entire population for the, the remainder of their pregnancy and um, into the postpartum period. There was one patient who had um, a symptomatic POP DVT at day number 90. So this is a very nice, um, a very nice way to assess folks for pulmonary embolism because it really decreased the exposure to CTPA during pregnancy. So if you don't have to expose somebody to radiation, it's a nice way to go. They did find that uh, the rate of avoiding exposure did diminish um, as the gestational age increased simply because the D-dimer levels uh, increased with each trimester, but still saving 35% of women exposure to uh, CTPA during a third trimester is very decent. And ACOG is actually looking at considering these as part of their future guidelines um, for evaluating pregnant women in pregnancy or for PE. When you look at treating patients uh, in pregnancy for thromboembolic disease, low molecular weight heparin is the right answer. Unfractionated heparin is still an option um, on the test. Uh, they, they do throw both of those in there. But on the whole, we don't use a whole lot of unfractionated heparin just because uh, low molecular weight heparin does such a good job and it's much easier to use. Um, it doesn't rely on GFR. You don't have to um, change the dose based on trimester. You just have to pretty much know what their, their starting weight was in pregnancy. Oops, went the wrong way there. Sorry about that. So when you look at Prophylactic versus adjusted dose, low molecular weight heparin. It's very easy. Prophylactic doses are 40 milligrams sub-Q once a day. Adjusted dose is a milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. And the perinatologists tend to follow the um, anti-10A levels. And they'll follow them for quite a while. And if somebody's pretty steady on their low molecular weight heparin, they won't test them every week, but they'll start spacing it out. But it's much easier than using the unfractionated heparin. Because when you do adjusted dose on fractionated heparin, you actually um, have to give them a whole lot of heparin, 10,000 units uh, or more sub-Q every 12 hours. You have to follow PTT levels. For prophylaxis, um, that's even a pain in the behind because you can't just get used to one dose once a day. You have to increase the dose uh, every trimester and it has to be given twice a day. So just a little bit more complicated. You know, if you can have compliance taking medication once a day, is going to be better than twice a day. And so the uh, general guidelines are low molecular weight heparin based on general on early pregnancy body weight and working with a multidisciplinary team when you're worried about uh, a pregnant person who has not only uh, pulmonary embolism, but um, a, a DVT as well, because we don't treat those as outpatients for the most part. When you look at other options for anticoagulant, Coumadin is not one of them. If um, exposed to Coumadin early in pregnancy or Warfarin early in pregnancy, there is Warfarin embryology. And that is more common um, like every other exposure uh, before the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. But anybody who is on uh, Warfarin or Coumadins for uh, valve-related disease they should be counseled uh, before they ever can consider becoming pregnant that they need to be changed over to a low molecular weight heparin as soon as they think they're pregnant, continuing that through the first trimester. And then if their cardiologist feels that Coumadin or Warfarin is their better uh, medication, they can then get them back on that after first trimester. DOACs still have not been um, okayed in pregnancy and they are not, uh, recommended for breastfeeding either, uh, they do cross the placenta. They, so anything that crosses the placenta typically crosses the, in, into breast milk as well, and you don't want to have a fetal coagulation issue. So low molecular weight heparin is it. When you talk about thrombolysis, uh, thrombolysis recommendations are the same as for non-pregnant individuals. If it's life or limb threatening and typically catheter directed, Cable filters are not um, routinely recommended in pregnancy, unless, of course, for the same uh, indications as a non-pregnant person, 
Um, you're going to go into delivery within a couple of weeks of a massive uh, DVT or um, you've had a recurrent DVT despite anticoagulation, then you have to consider a filter. The problem with filters in pregnancy is that you have a higher risk of perforation and filter migration. Uh, so getting them in there, getting them in the right place and keeping them in the right place is a little bit more complicated. If somebody comes to you asking, you know, what do I need to do with my pregnant person with regards to uh, prophylaxing them? Do I have to worry about whether or not they're going to get a DVT? Should they be on Lovenox? Again, know everything about them, know their past history, um, know their weight, know their pregnancy complications, know their family history. And the category that is always the hardest um, to remember, anybody who's had a clot, who's had a, a provoked clot related to hormones or who's had two clots, you know, they're going to have to be uh, prophylaxed or, or adjust or adjust a dose of low molecular weight heparin during pregnancy. But the prophylactic ones are if a, if a woman has had a single unprovoked uh, clot, clotting, uh, whether it's a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, uh, a venous thrombolic uh, event, they need prophylaxis. If they've had a VTE with a hormone, birth control, um, any kind of hormone replacement or a previous pregnancy, they need to be prophylaxed in the pregnancy that they're seeing you. If they have a low risk thrombophilia, with a personal history of a clot or a family history of a clot, they need to be prophylaxed. And if they have a high risk thrombophilia with a history, yeah, without a history, sorry, if they have a high risk thrombophilia without the history of the clot, um, then they need prophylaxis. So your high risk thrombophilias are antithrombin deficiency, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and then factor five homozygous prothrombin variants, homozygous, or a compound heterozygosity of factor V and prothrombin together. So those are your high-risk ones, and those require uh, management during pregnancy, not only with um, anticoagulant, but they, need, they are referred to the perinatologist as well to watch for placental and growth-related issues. Low-risk um, thrombophilias are a heterogeneous heterozygotic state of factor V or prothrombin or the protein S protein C deficiencies. So for us, um, OBGYNs and um, venous disease specialists, when you find somebody with a DVT during pregnancy or you know suspect a PE during pregnancy, you have to call their OBGYNs. This is not somebody that you're going to start an anticoagulant on and send them home. Uh, we hospitalize folks because we have to figure out a lot of different things um, before we actually send them home on an anticoagulant. You have to know that there is a viable pregnancy uh, in the uterus, right? Regardless of being first trimester or third trimester, you want to know that A, it's in the uterus and not uh, an ectopic pregnancy that you're going to help mom bleed to death if you give her uh, anticoagulant. But you also have to know the status of the pregnancy. Unfortunately, not every pregnant woman walking around can tell when her baby's heart stops. And if you give that person medication on Monday and they go for an evaluation um, with their doctor the next day and their baby doesn't have a heartbeat, you did it. So even though there's no way to tell that, that's, that's going to be the link there. So we always have to make sure that we get an ultrasound, that we know where the, where the pregnancy is. Is there a good heartbeat? Does the baby look healthy? What's the placenta look like? And we monitor uh, pregnant women uh, in the hospital to make sure that their baby is completely happy and healthy. We do monitor strips. We make sure that they're not having any contractions. We make sure that there's no bleeding behind the placenta. There's no previa uh, before we actually let them go home on their anticoagulant. For treating uh, SVT during pregnancy, it's the same parameters as non-pregnancy, five centimeters greater in length, proximity to the confluence. And the treatment is 40 milligrams of Lovenox sub-Q daily. And you tell that to the OBGYN, you've got a clot, this is the recommendation. And then they run with that or they work with their perinatologist. And these days, everybody works with the perinatologist on everything. 
So this is why you want to make sure that you're not the one who is prescribing the um, anticoagulant and sending them home on that. If there is any subchorionic bleed and the person miscarries, it's your fault. If they've got an accreta, um, this, is, this is just a nightmare situation. And the same with any kind of retroplacental clot. So we let our OBGYN friends look at these, make sure that this patient is safe to receive anticoagulant, but you should know the recommendations because uh, you can often be in, in a hospital situation or just um, in the clinic and being able to tell um, the OBGYN what the recommendations are is pretty much in our wheelhouse. Afterward, um, after pregnancies, after all is said and done, especially if someone has had an extensive DVT or an iliofemoral DVT, um, May Thurner is, it, it happens. I mean, if nothing else, pregnancy is that compression initiator there if they're not born with that kind of anatomy. But one pregnancy or three pregnancies, if they have a clot, it's in the left-hand side, they generally have a May Thurner anatomy there. You get a chronic DVT, you get your webbing, and then their risk for post-thrombotic leg is as high as anyone else who's got May Thurner. And if you know that this is a young woman, they're going to want future pregnancies to get them in to uh, look at their, their veins with pelvic ultrasound, venogram, IVUS, so that they can plan for future pregnancy. The very nice thing is if somebody has May Thurner or has all this webbing from a, a significant DVT um, after their pregnancy with the clot, you can tell them that not only is there something that can be done about this to go in and stent it is not um, as high risk as perhaps once thought. CVM had a very nice paper where they didn't ask women to go out and get pregnant after their stents were put in, but they had young women who were stented who had subsequent pregnancies. The women were followed through their pregnancies and there was not an increased risk of compression damage or intramural thrombus um, with those stents, granted they were on prophylaxis, and there was no threat to the pregnancy. There were not an increased number of preterm deliveries, complex deliveries, uh, growth restriction, or any other concerns that would keep you from properly managing these folks before their next pregnancy. So there's a lot of good stuff we can offer, and that's all I got. So thank you, Teresa. That was very comprehensive as, as normal. Um, I have a couple of questions, though. So uh, because I do see a lot of these patients at, at CBM, uh, we it's not uncommon for me to see somebody who does have an iliac vein stenosis. And then they ask me, well, what's the risk of getting a DVT when I get pregnant? And I don't know the answer to that question. So uh, I, I will say anecdotally, the women who have gone on to get pregnant and not say get stented or not get treated, they don't seem to get a DVT. But it always worries me that when you have a high grade stenosis like that, as the fetus you know enlarges, that there's going to be some compression there. Because I have seen women with massive iliofemoral DVTs during pregnancy and where I've been asked to either place a filter or consider open thrombectomy for. So what are your feelings about that? So you're right. I mean, anybody who is considering pregnancy, they they don't want to do anything that could potentially hurt their their pregnancy. And I think if you give them the information that there is an increased risk of clot with a May Thurner finding, let their obstetrician gynecologist know, have them followed, have them watched. But you're right. I see a lot of pregnant women and I've only had one or two that had an iliofemoral clot out of thousands of women. So with May Thurner being common, you're, it's probably not wise to go and put a stent in before somebody has an event like that. But I think to counsel them to say, look, you're at increased risk. And if you have more swelling or more pain in this, you know, in your legs, don't, don't blow it off, go to your gynecologist. But I think the obstetricians have to know too that yeah. If that you know that person has to be a little um, higher on their their risk ratio, you know, for getting a study done. So the other question I get from uh, the uh, OBs all the time is the timing of discontinuation just before delivery. So what do you? What is there an ACOG recommendation on that standard? Or what are you telling people? <clears throat> so what most of the perinatologists used to do 
is they'd have folks on low molecular weight heparin, and then they would switch them to unfractionated heparin, usually about two weeks before their um, their due date minimally. If somebody had a history of a 39 week delivery in past, they'd pull that back to 37 and they'd put them on unfractionated heparin. And then if they were inducible, they would tell them stop your your unfractionated heparin 12 hours before we admit you. Um, if somebody is starting to labor, we'll tell them to hold their dose of of uh, Lovenox and that could be six hours, eight hours, or 24 hours before they deliver. But in, in a perfect world, it is transitioning somebody from low molecular weight heparin to unfractionated heparin about two to three weeks before um, their expected delivery date. And then you made a comment about um, not, I mean, being careful about keeping people on heparin if they're going to breastfeed. But in the higher risk patients or in the women who have, say, a DVT, who the recommendation is to continue for at least six weeks after delivery, correct? No, so, exactly and- right. Now, um, unfractionated heparin and Lovenox are not passed in breast milk. It's the it's the DOEX. It's the so DOEX. if I misspoke, that, that no, because they do have to be continued for six weeks after delivery, yes. So Lovenox is, Lovenox is fine? Lovenox is perfect. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Good. For the most part, anything you can use in pregnancy, you can use during breastfeeding. So if I said that, I, I really, I read my own notes incorrectly, but um, the only things you don't want uh, with breastfeeding are Coumadin and DOEX. And also just for the fellows, you met, you mentioned a compound heterozygote. I just want to make sure what the fellows know that what that means is that you're a heterozygote for the factor five and the prothrombin two together. In Teresa's notes, if you're just a heterozygote for one or the other, that, that puts you in the low risk category. But if you're a compound heterozygote, that puts you in the higher risk category. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions? No? Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, yep. as usual, a brilliant talk. Thank you, Teresa. That's right. I, I love hearing hearing this talk. All right, guys. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.